Hey everyone, welcome to Power Electronics. I'm Tim, and this is Lecture Zero. So the purpose of this lecture series is to provide an online resource for you guys, you know, whoever is taking a Power Electronics course. I really want to provide some extra material for those who need it. On the other side, I want an opportunity to learn how to deliver lectures online. And you know, hopefully I can grow and develop as an educator. And, uh, before we get started, this is gonna be like a, a chalk and talk kind of thing. So we'll go through problems, We'll go through some theory, we'll talk, we'll, I'll write stuff, you know, I'll write stuff on, on the uh, on the screen. And hopefully that's helpful, we'll change colors and stuff. Uh, for reference, we're going to be using, or really, for the most part, I'm following the textbook Fundamentals of Power Electronics. By Erickson and Maximovich. I really hope there's a K in Erickson. I believe there is. Anyways, there's, I studied from the second edition and I think they're just releasing a third edition. Either they've released it or they're going to release it very soon. In either case, I strongly recommend that you check this out, check this textbook out. If you're not using it, if you are using it, congrats. Furthermore, I also suggest that you guys take notes while you watch this lecture series because you know it'll help you kind of interact with material firsthand as you're as you're absorbing information and hopefully that will make the information stick a bit better cool so this lecture or this course really what i'm trying to do is introduce switch mode power supplies to you guys so introduce some converters introduce the concepts behind switch mode power supplies the concepts behind power electronics in general i also want to give you some tools to analyze and understand power electronics. So maybe you haven't seen a particular converter before. Hopefully by the end of this course, you'll have the knowledge to understand what's going on, even if you've never seen it. Finally, I want to give you guys some practical design considerations because, you know, there's a lot of theory you can learn in courses like this. But when you go and sit down and try to actually build a converter, often there are a bunch of extra things that you need to take into account that you might not learn in a course that would be really helpful to know to make your converter work well. Cool, so this isn't really a foundational course. You need to know a few, a few different things in order to fully appreciate what's going on. Namely, you need to know some calculus, not super, we're not doing a, a bunch of integrals, crazy substitutions and stuff like that, it's pretty simple. But you're gonna have to understand calculus, the idea of integration, the idea of differentiation, Fourier Laplace transforms, you know, that kind of comes from circuit theory. You're going to have to know circuit theory, which is, I mean, this is a circuit course. So you have to understand circuits to understand what's going on here. Some analog electronics, some digital electronics, and some control theory. So people often make the distinction, a power supply is a power converter with a control loop around it. So control is like really a fundamental part of power electronics. Understanding how to control power converters is incredibly important. And hopefully we get there, but you should have some, some idea of what's going on. So first of all, what is power electronics, right? We should kind of define what we're talking about. Well, I think the simplest way I can, I can say it is that power electronics are electronics which control the flow of power, right? It's in the name already, right? So we have sources, things which produce power, and we have loads, things which consume power. And power electronics are the thing that we put in between sources and loads to control that flow. And sometimes the, the idea of a source and the idea of a load isn't so clear cut and you know power flows in multiple directions. But in any case, electronics which control power flow are power electronics. So it's a little different from say analog electronics where you're kind of interested in the information in signals, right? You're there's like noise floors and stuff like that. You're worried about gain, amplifying signals. In power electronics, you're more interested in the energy in signals. So that, I, maybe that's kind of a, an easier way to distinguish the two fields, although there is a lot of crossover. Okay, so why do we need power electronics? We, we kind of know what it is. It controls power flow. Why do we need electronic, power electronics? Well, think about devices, first of all. Think about you know smartphones, laptops, TVs, all these things have different components inside of them, right? So your smartphone has like a, a processor, it has a screen, it has an antenna. 
your laptop, again, processor, maybe there's a graphics card or something. But there's a bunch of different components inside these devices, and they all require different voltages. But typically there's only one source of power, right? There might be a single battery. And you need to supply these different devices, which have different constraints, or diff sorry, different components, which have different constraints, right? The CPU might require, say, 1.2 volts to operate, while the sc screen might require 20 volts to for maximum brightness, something like that, right? And we have a single power supply, so we need to figure out how to take that power from one source and provide it to multiple loads, which all have varying requirements, right? So all these things, they need power, but they need power with specific constraints. You need specific voltages to operate certain components within these devices or specific currents, right? We need, we need specific constraints. On the, on the other side, think about how we produce power, right? There's things like power plants and renewables. So power plants, maybe there's a steam powered turbine which produces an AC voltage. That's pretty regular, right? We can like burn stuff and that, like we can produce steam to turn something. We can produce power pretty regularly that, that way, but it is AC voltage. It's inherently AC voltage, right? That's typically how we, how we do it. On the other side, there's renewables, right? So wind turbines, again, it produce, those produce AC voltages. And there's also photovoltaics, which produce DC voltages. But renewables are really environmentally constrained, right? If it's a windy day or a bright day, you're going to produce more power. But if it's not so windy or not so bright, you're going to produce less power. So there's like a variation in the power that renewables can produce. You can also think about how we transmit power, right? So AC, we transmit power AC, and we also transmit power or take it from our power plants. At ex I, we deliver it at extremely high voltages, right? Power delivery from power plants to cities or whatever is at megavolts or whatever, something so high that you as a human cannot interact with. And we have to figure out how to turn that power that we're delivering from our sources into something that humans can interact with without it being dangerous. And you can also think about batteries, right? Storing energy chemically. Batteries produce DC voltages, but that voltage isn't constant, right? It varies based on the state of charge of the battery, varies based on the temperature of the battery, the health of the battery, so-called health of the battery. So over time, maybe you want a specific voltage out of a battery, but as you use it, that voltage will vary. So the way we produce power and transmit power is at different voltages, and it might also be variable, right? It might change over time. So considering these two things, what I want to point out is that there is a dissimilarity between sources and loads. The way we produce power or the power that we get and want to use might not be the power that our loads require. So we need something to rectify that difference. We need something to force what we have, the power we have, into the power that we need. Secondly, I want to point out, which is we didn't really talk about, but power demand is kind of random. It's not constant. If you think about being in your house, during the day, you're, the lights in your house are not on. But when it gets dark enough, you're going to decide at some point, right? It's not predetermined what time you turn the lights on. But at some point, you're going to turn the lights on, right? That's a random decision you have made that na right now, I need more power. And that change in power requirements requires something to like regulate it, right? If, if you if you think about like a power grid, right? If there's a difference between how much power we produce and how much power we consume, then that can often result in disastrous effects, maybe like blackouts or like rolling blackouts, brownouts, something like that. It can seriously affect the power grid. And for that reason, we need some kind of control over the power that we're transmitting between sources and loads. Okay, so we kind of know that we need something to regulate power. Now let's look at how we can change power, how we can change voltages. And thinking about DC and AC voltages, there are kind of four ways, right? So the first way is if we have one DC voltage and we wanted to turn it into a second DC voltage, a different DC voltage, or maybe the same. Sometimes you do have converters which have a one-to-one -one conversion ratio. The, the output voltage is the same as the input, but for the most part, you have one DC voltage and you want to produce a different one. 
this is kind of the most common kind of uh, power converter. Inside all electronic devices, as I mentioned before, like your cell phone, there's, a, there's one power source, but there's a bunch of different components that require different voltages. So you need DC to DC power supplies or DC to DC converters inside your phone to spread that power around, kind of, right? So these are the most common. This is where, where we're going to be spending a lot of our time. This is where we're going to learn the fundamentals. So this is like what we're going to use to learn power electronics, right? The, the fundamentals of power electronics, let's say. And there's different classes. There's hard switching. There's soft switching. The list goes on. There's a bunch of different sub classifications of DC to DC converters, but we're going to be spending a lot of time here. This is the next kind of section we're going to get into. But let's think about the next option, right? So maybe you have an AC voltage and you want to produce a DC voltage. And these things are known as rectifiers. So AC to DC converter, rectifier, really the same kind of, like you can use them interchangeably, basically. Some rectifiers are passive, some are active. And again, you're really familiar with this already. Like think about your charger for your laptop or your charger from your phone. The wall pr provides, the outlet provides uh, an AC voltage at some frequency, some voltage. And your phone, let's say, requires five volts to charge the battery. Like th that, this is like a, a daily thing that you interact with. And may maybe you weren't aware of it, but maybe you were. Again, yeah, we'll, we'll get here later. It requires some extra concepts to really understand how to, how to do this in a reasonable way but it's also a very common kind of converter. The next, you might have a DC to AC conversion. So you have some DC voltage and you wanna turn it into an alternating voltage. Again, this is pretty common. These are called inverters, by the way. They invert a DC voltage. And uh, yeah, these, these are really common. If you think about, I'll just stick this R in a little bit clearer. If you think about like an electric vehicle, an electric vehicle stores energy inside of it in batteries. And eventually you have to turn some wheel. So you have to, you know, make that constant voltage in, into an alternating vo voltage in order to make that rotation happen. And yeah, the, basically the inverter in, uh, in an electric vehicle is really like the motor, right? It's the engine of the electric vehicle. So you can think about EVs if you want to think about it in further. Obviously, there are other applications, but that's probably the most common. Finally, there's AC to AC converters. And these are kind of like the least common. So you have one AC voltage, and you maybe want to produce a different AC voltage, different amplitude, different frequency. Then you'd need an AC to AC converter. Maybe an example is if you had two different power grids that you wanted to share power between, you'd need some kind of AC to AC converter in order, in order to link those grids. So maybe we'll get here. But again, it's not so common. There's kind of ways of getting around it. You can do different things. High voltage DC links are possible. But yeah, may maybe we'll get here much later on though. Okay, so we've kind of discussed that we need something. We discuss we've discussed ways that we can convert voltages. Let's look at a particular example. So for now, we're gonna start super simple. We're gonna start with a battery and we want one volt at the output. So typically batteries vary based on their state of charge, based on their health, temperature, all that kind of stuff, they vary between, a single cell lithium ion battery anyways, varies between say 2.5 volts and 4.2 volts. I'll, I'll provide a link in, in, the, in the description for maybe a, a data sheet of a battery. So let's just say this is what we have. And I don't want you to think that this is varying very quickly. Maybe over the course of a day, it changes from 4.2 to 2.5 volts. So in short intervals of time, the voltage looks fixed. It just happens that it could be one thing, it could be 2.5, it could be 4.2, we don't know. On the other side, we, we want an output voltage of one volts. So first we can model our battery as a voltage source, right? With a voltage VBAT. Again, this is, this is kind of variable. And then our load, I'm just going to model it as a resistor our load. So maybe your resistor isn't 
uh, the most common kind of load, especially for low power stuff. But, you know, like a stove is basically a resistor. A toaster is basically a resistor. Resistive loads do exist. But for electronics, your load is probably something different. Probably something like a, a CPU or it's something like uh, an amplifier or something else. And an amplifier is kind of, in a sense, a resistive load as well. In any case, I'm going to use a resistor to model loads in general. Sometimes we'll, maybe we'll look at current source loads, but for now, resistive loads. So we want one volt at this, at, at, across this load resistor at all times. So we're going to, because our source varies, because our source and load are dissimilar, the source isn't providing exactly what we need. We need to stick something in between our battery and our load resistor in order to force the output voltage to be what we want. So the question is, what is this thing? What do we put in between our battery and our load? Well, if you've taken a first year circuit theory course, maybe what comes to mind is a voltage divider, right? This, this would work. So let's just quickly go over how a voltage divider works. I'm sure all of you guys know how to do this, but for those of you who don't, we can look at this loop. We have a single loop and we have an input voltage and an output voltage, V1 and V2. So we can say that there is some current I flowing through this loop and we want to find a relation between V2 and V1. So to do that, well, we can notice that if I flows through this loop, it must flow through R2. And then as a result, the voltage across V2 is simply I times R2, right? All right, I flows through R2, so the voltage across the resistor, R2 is V2, V2 must equal I times R2. Similarly, for V1, we can notice that I flows through R1 and R2, and V1 must be the sum of the voltages across resistor R1 and across resistor R2. That means that V1 must be equal to I times R1 plus R2. And if we want to find a relation between these two voltages, we can simply divide these two equations. If we do that, this is the relation we get. So we can find the voltage V2 as a function of V1 and these resistors. So what I want you to notice here is that this term is always less than one, right? R2 is strictly less than R1 plus R2 because resistors, real resistors are always positive. So this, this voltage divider or resistive divider, whatever, whatever you want to say, divides the input voltage. The input voltage is always less than the output voltage or the output voltage is always less than the input voltage. This ratio is always less than one. So for our particular application, we could do this, right? Because our output voltage, one volt is always less than the total range of the battery voltage, 2.5 volts to 4.2 volts. So we could do this. So all we have to do is place a resistor in series with our source, VBAT, and our load, our load, right? And we would vary this resistance in order to force V out to be one volt. So this is the, the equation we get. So kind of, I think in, in first year circuits, typically what you might encounter is something like you have an input voltage and you have particular resistors and you have to calculate what the output voltage will be. In this case, what we're doing is we're, we're saying we want V out to be one volt. We, this is what we want. So we have to find, and we let's say we know what the current is. Our load is, is defined. That tells us what our load current is. We want this to be one volt and our battery voltage could be something. So we have to find our series. We, we choose our series to make our output voltage be one volt. So we vary our series. We, you can imagine it's like a, a pot or a rheostat or something like that, some kind of variable resistor. And as the battery voltage varies, you tune this voltage, or this resistor to force V out to be one volt. So yeah, th this could totally work. People do this. However, they don't. there isn't someone sitting at a resistor turning it to regulate an output voltage. Typically what people do is something like this. So here we're using a transistor as a resistor, as a variable resistor. We control the gate of this transistor with some control circuit. In this case, we have an op amp. And this 
resistance varies based on the gate voltage. And this thing is called an LDO, a low dropout regulator. And this is super common. This is a very common kind of power converter. People, people use it in, in low power applications often for specific, specific applications. So let's just go over how this works. So I'll just label the voltage across this element as VLDO and the voltage here as V gate. And what's going on is we're comparing our output voltage to some reference. In this case, the reference would be one volt. That's what we want the output voltage to be. So if V out is less than V ref, then that means we have a positive voltage at the input terminals of this op amp, right? So the, the non-inverting terminal would be greater than the inverting terminal, which means there's a positive voltage, which means the output of the op amp, the vo output voltage of the op amp would increase. So the gate voltage would increase. So if V out is less than V ref, what tends to happen is V gate increases. As V gate increases, the resistance of this transistor goes down. So I'll just say RLDO decreases, right? If RLDO decreases, then that means that the volt for the same current, right? The voltage across this element decreases. So VLDO goes down. If VLDO goes down, then if you consider this loop, if VLDO goes down, then V out must increase to compensate so that V bat is equal to VLDO plus V out, right? So this forces V out to increase just based on KVL. Right, so if we're below the reference, then the op amp will try to force the output voltage to increase. On the other side, if V out is greater than V ref, then we have a negative voltage at the input of this op amp, which makes the gate voltage tend to, de to decrease, tends to go down. As the gate voltage decreases, then the resistance of the transistor tends to increase. Right, This is, a, this is an n-type transistor which then causes the voltage across the element, VLDO, to increase, right? Because for the same current, a higher resistance will have a higher voltage drop. So VLDO will increase, which will then cause V out to decrease, right? To compensate so that this, the KVL holds, right? So V out will then go down. So in this way, by using this control loop, we can force the output voltage to be the reference voltage. Right, so we can regulate an output voltage using a resistive divider in this way. But I want to point out a few things. So the voltage divider, the, resist, the resistive divider, there are kind of two problems. The first, we can only step the voltage down, right? That's what I mentioned before. This ratio, this ratio here is always less than one, which means that V out must always be less than V in. In this case, let's say V bat. And the question is, what happens if we need a larger voltage than what is provided at the input? What happens if we need, say, 5 volts for this battery? The, a voltage divider can't do that. It's impossible to do that. So that's a problem that this resistive way of regulating output voltage cannot deal with. The second problem is, or the second idea, idea I want to introduce, is kind of brought about by this question. How much power goes to the output? and how much power is drawn from the input. So the concept that this is uh, kind of bring, bringing about is the idea of power processing efficiency, which we refer to as, or the symbol we use is eta. And eta is a ratio of the output power to the input power. And this is kind of like the most important metric for power converters. Okay, so basically we want eta to tend towards 100%. So you could you could multiply this by 100%, right, to make it a percentage. Typically efficiencies are given in percentages. So we want the efficiency to be as close to 100% as possible. What that means is that we want P out to be as close to P in as possible, or 
let's say this is what we want. We want P out to be P in. We want all the power we put into the converter to come out of the converter as useful energy, useful output power P out. The difference between the output or the input power and the output power, how much we put in and how much we get out is known as the loss, P loss. And P loss is power which does, does no useful work. So this does no useful work. It's wasted. This is wasted energy. Sorry, there's no useful work. P loss is wasted energy. We don't want to waste any energy. Be well, one, wasting energy is wasteful, first of all. But second of all, that waste, that wasted energy tends to uh, manifest as heat. And you, you're all kind of familiar with that, right? Think about like your charger when you're using your laptop, right? The, the It gets hot as, as you use it. And that's because it's wasting energy trying to convert the voltage at the, at your outlet into the voltage that your laptop requires. So it's, it's wasting heat or it's wasting energy in order to do that. And that is heating up your charger. So heat often ends up being a significant problem in, in some applications, but Typically, things just don't operate as well when they're hotter. Sometimes they do. In very particular applications, they do. But again, it, it can cause problems. Right? So our loss turns into heat. We don't want that. We want efficiency. We want all of the power we put in to do useful stuff. He heating things up usually is not a useful thing. All right. So let's look, at, let's look a bit deeper into the efficiency of this voltage divider right? to understand what's going on, to evaluate if this is good or not. All right, so what we can do is look at the input power and the output power. And again, we can just simply imagine that there's some current flowing through here, I, right? So the current flows through the load resistor, flows through the series resistance, and it flows through the battery. So this battery is a source. We have some current flowing out of the positive terminal. According to passive sign convention, that means it's sourcing power. You can make that assumption and then correct it later if you... If you uh, if it turns out to be wrong or produce a negative sign. But in this case, the input power is a product of the battery voltage and this current that's flowing through this loop, right? So it's VBAT times I. And the output power, again, we're, ch we're forcing V out to be one volt by adjusting this series resistance. So we can assume that the output voltage is always one volt. We're doing our job, we're regulating the output voltage, it's always one volt. So that means that the output power is simply I times V out, or V out times I. And again, just to remind you guys, eta, the power processing efficiency, is a ratio of the output power to the input power. So if we plug in our equations, this is what we get. It's a ratio of V out times I over V bat times I, and we can multiply it by 100% if we want to. And if we simplify, we notice that it is a ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage. Again, times 100% if you would like. I won't get mad at you if you leave that out, but often it's percentage. So the efficiency of this resistive divider is simply a ratio of the input to output voltage. So this does not depend on how much current you're sending through this. Basically, if there is a difference between V out and V bad, then the efficiency will be small. So if V out is much less than, or sorry, much, much less than V bad, then eta is going to tend towards zero, right? If V out is really, really small, then just based on the fact that there's a difference in voltages, this ratio says that the efficiency will tend towards zero. Let's look at a particular example though, right? Just to, to make sure you understand what's going on. So, Let's just imagine the lowest battery voltage, 2.5 volts. And again, the output voltage is one volt. Sorry, one volt. And if we do this ratio, if we look at if we look at the efficiency, we get it's one volt. The efficiency is one volt over 2.5 volts, which is 40%. Is this good? Is this bad? I would argue that's bad, 
let's look at the loss just to just to see what's going on. So let's say let's imagine that p out is one watt. We want the output power to be one watt. That means, according to this efficiency, that the input power p in is 2.5 watts. And you guys can do the math if you want to check that out, but that's what it is. So the input power is 2.5 watts if we want one watt at the output. That means that the loss, the difference between the input and output power is 1.5 watts, right? So we lose more power than what we get at the output, right? For 40% efficiency. To me, that is not a good solution, right? It, for a lot of applications, that, is, that would not be satisfactory. We're wasting far more than we output. And just to give you guys some reference, dissipating, say, one watt of power on your skin, let's say on like a centimeter squared of your skin, it would burn you. It would probably be like a second degree burn, something like that. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but it would hurt. It would, it would be noticeable and you wouldn't want to be dissipating one watt of power on your skin. Let's just leave it at that. But one point, so for every one watt that we output, we have to burn 1.5 watts. We have to waste 1.5 watts if our efficiency is 40%. So the question is, how do we do better? How do we do better than 40%? How, if, if we wanna make the output voltage much smaller than the input, how do we get a better efficiency? Well, the answer is don't use resistors, right? That I hope that uh, has already come to your mind, but again, we don't have to use resistors. It just happens that you know voltage dividers are a common thing that you could use if you wanted to, but we don't have to use resistors. So let's not use resistors. We have other things. We have capacitors, we have inductors, we have transistors, we have diodes, and these are kind of the main building blocks of power of power converters. There are there are other things, of course, but this is kind of what we're going to be looking at to create a more efficient converter. So that's it for now. That, that I just wanted to introduce the idea of you know converting voltages, converting power. And next lecture, we're going to derive the buck converter, which is kind of the first converter, the pri like the primordial converter of power electronics, the simplest, the simplest one, and in some cases, the, the most elegant kind of converter. But yeah, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time. Thanks.